31 years ago, or be exact, June 27, 1976, there was an Air France jet that was hijacked, Flight 139. There were 248 passengers, and it was hijacked by two Palestinian terrorists together with two uh, German, uh, what we would call as uh, also terrorists in some ways, but they were more of uh, they were more of uh, idealists. And the plane was flying out from Israel and headed towards Paris, France. It landed at Athens, Greece, for refueling and to pick up some additional passengers. It so happened that the four terrorists who got on board the plane got on board at Athens. And when the plane had taken off, they immediately declared their intentions that this was a hijacking. Then the plane flew to the city of Benghazi in Libya, where it refueled. And afterwards, it uh, landed at the Kenkeni Airport in the nation of Uganda. And at that time, uh, Uganda was under the regime of Idi Amin. Uh, and Idi Amin supported the terrorists. Now, after some initial negotiations, the non-Jewish passengers were released. And so what was left behind were around 106 hostages made up of 84 Jews or Israelis, 12 members of the Air France crew, and 10 French passengers who were, in a way, sympathetic towards the Jews. And so these hostages were detained and they were brought to the transit hall of the airport terminal where they were kept. Now, Political negotiations took place between uh, the nation of Israel and the terrorists. But after uh, some time, the negotiations failed. And so Israel had no choice but to send its IDF, or the Israeli Defense Force. And they planned a rescue mission which involved 100 soldiers or 100 commandos. And so this mission was called Operation Thunderbolt. And they entered into Uganda using three of these planes, C-130 planes. And their mission was very precise. Once they landed at the Entebbe airport and they flew just a few hundred feet okay, below the radar entering into Uganda. After, even before the plane had totally landed, the doors had already opened, vehicles were already racing out from the plane. And they began to move towards the terminal where the hostages were kept captive. And once inside the terminal, these soldiers immediately shouted and told the people to stay down uh, addressed the hostages. And they used both Hebrew and English to give their instructions. And all the hostage takers were killed. But unfortunately, three hostages they got, got killed also. One of the hostages got killed was a French immigrant from Israel. And the reason was because instead of staying down, he stood up, probably out of panic or because he misunderstood the instruction. Also, one member of the IDF was killed. The leader of the raiding team was named Jonathan Netanyahu. He happens to be the older brother of the current Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu. But overall, the rescue mission was considered successful. Why? Because there were very few casualties among the hostages and the rescuers. And this risk rescue mission would become the inspiration to some video games, like if you are familiar with uh, Tom Clancy's Rogue, Rogue Spears uh, video game. And it also uh, inspired a fictional movie called Delta Force. If you are a Chuck Norris fan, you probably have watched this movie. And it also inspired some dramatizations, like uh, a Charles Bronson movie and I don't read on Entebbe, and then the other one, Victory at Entebbe. Uh, I first heard about this story many, many years back. And as you read through the story, you are very impressed with how the IDF, the Israeli Defense Force, pulled off the rescue mission. But as you compare this story, with the story that we just read from Exodus, 
you will have to admit that God pulled it off even better. God's rescue mission was even more precise. It was even more dramatic in some ways. And of course, it was totally effective. This morning, we're looking at an important event in the Bible. It is the deliverance of the people of Israel from their slavery in Egypt. And today, we know of this event as the Passover. And there are some lessons that we can learn about God's deliverance and its application for us today. Now let me begin with a bit of background. We all know that at the end of Exodus 10, uh, nine plagues had already struck the land of Egypt. And they had left the land in total ruin. Pharaoh, however, continues to harden his heart against God and against Moses. And he refuses to let the people go. And so the Lord threatens to bring about one more plague upon the land of Egypt. And so in Exodus 11, Moses enters into the presence of Pharaoh and he warns him there will be one more plague. And he makes clear to Pharaoh that every firstborn in the land of Egypt would surely die, regardless of it being the firstborn of a slave girl, or the firstborn of the cattle, or even the firstborn of Pharaoh himself. Moses also said that those who have suffered loss will beg for the Israelites to be. But even after Moses gave this warning, Pharaoh did not take the warning seriously. His heart remains hardened towards God. He has no intentions of letting the Israelites go. And so we come to Exodus 12. And in Exodus 12, the Lord now reveals to Moses what will surely happen when the tenth plague strikes. And he gives important instructions that Moses should convey to the Israelites. These instructions would make the difference between deliverance and devastating loss. If you remember during the earlier plagues, Israel did not do did not need to do anything to escape the plague. Like for example, when there was the plague of darkness, if we read the scriptures, it said that all the land of Egypt was dark except the land where the Israelites lived in, the land of Goshen. And so we see that the Israelites at that time did not need to do anything or they did not need to lift a finger in order to save themselves from the plagues. So in other words, God simply accepted Goshen, the place where the Israelites lived in, from being hit by the plagues. But this time, however, God makes clear that it is the whole land of Egypt, including Goshen, that will be affected by this tenth plague. Now, as you read the passage, you will realize that the center of the instructions involved around the slaughtering of a lamb or a kid, a kid being a um, goat. Now, why did God use a lamb or a kid to do this work of salvation? What is the significance of this event for us today? I want for us to look at the requirements that God has set for the lamb that would be used in the deliverance of the Israelites from the tenth day, and how this is relevant for us today. And what is clear is that the lamb or the kid will be offered as a sacrifice, a sacrifice by each household in place of their firstborn. Now, I'd like to look at four things, four, we could say, requirements with regards to the lamb or the kid. First of all, God says that the lamb or the kid must be without blemish. There must be no trace of uh, deformity in, in the animal. What this meant was that there must be no natural imperfections in the animal, no disease, 
uh, no deficiency of parts or redundancy of parts. What does that mean? It means that the animals will not be missing a body part. Like uh, sometimes we see uh, pictures of animals that came out from the womb and it lacks a leg or a body part. Or an animal that has an additional part that's also not allowed. Like for example, you see animals where it has two heads. Okay, so that, that is not acceptable also. We also know that it must be an animal that is not afflicted with any disease. Or it should not manifest the after effects of a disease. This would become the standard later on for offerings or any sacrifices that people <coughs> want to God. Now, why did God require this? Why the requirement that the animal should be blemish free? It was because it symbolized a perfect substitute. Something that is without sin. You see, the lamb or the kid was to take the place of the firstborn of the households of Israel. He was to be a substitute, a perfect substitute. It therefore had to be an animal that God would say, okay, it is acceptable to me. And that is why it has to be without blemish, because it symbolizes something that is without sin, something that is perfect. Now the second requirement with regards to the lamb was that the lamb or kid must be male and a year old. Now why, why was it supposed to be a male? It had to be male because it was to take the place of the firstborn sons of Israel. You see the plague was specifically against every firstborn son in the land of Egypt. If you look at Exodus 11, 5, it makes clear every firstborn son in Egypt will lie. Whether it is the son of Pharaoh or the son of the female slave, and then of course the firstborn of the cattle. And so the animal that has to take the place of the firstborn males of Israel had to also be male in gender. Also the lamb or the kid had to be a year old in age. But according to some commentaries, what it simply means is that it should be between something like 8 days and 12 months. And that, that symbolized that the animal had to be at the prime of his life. In other words, it was to be the best sacrifice, not only because it was unblemished, but also because it was at the best period of its life. Uh, I think we can somehow relate to this when we talk about our food, like when we're eating uh, some kind of animal. Let's say, for example, we, I think a lot of us, we like to eat that job. But if we had a choice, we would not eat the one that is already a couple of years old, right? We prefer the one that's just a few months old. Why? Because it's more tasty, the meat is more tender. Okay? It's at the prime of its life. And that's why even today there's this, uh, there's this brand of processed meat where we say that they don't use the mother pig, but they use the what? The young pork, the young pig. Okay? The emphasis is on the prime of the life of the animal. And so, what God wanted was not just an animal that was unblemished, but He wanted an animal that was at its best in terms of its life. Now thirdly, the blood of the lamb or the kid had to be applied upon the entrance of the house. It's a given already that the animal must be sacrificed. But what we should not miss out was that the blood of the slain animal was to be applied on the sides and on the top of the door frames of the house of the Israelites. And here they would use the hyssop plant as a sprinkling device uh, because the leaves and the branches of this plant would hold liquid well. And so it was suitable for the past. 
And when the door was, uh, when the blood was applied on the sides and on the top of the door, it was to serve as a protection from the wrath of the Lord. Because if you read Exodus chapter 12, verses 12 and 13, it says that God would pass through Egypt and he would strike down the firstborn. But then it says, the blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plagues will touch you. And so verse, verse 12 makes clear, God will pass through the land, he will bring forth destruction. And then verse 13, the blood will serve as protection. And so this passing through the land was an act of judgment. It was an act of judgment against Pharaoh, and it was also an act of judgment against the gods of Egypt. The blood on the side, sides and the top of the door was the sign by which the Lord would bypass the house and spare its occupants. And so the shed blood symbolized the sacrifice offered as an act of substitution. A life that has been laid down for another. It was the evidence that something has died in place of the firstborn. And then fourthly, this animal had to be roasted over fire. It should not be boiled or eaten raw. And it was also to be consumed together with bitter herbs as well as bread made without meat. Any meat that was left unconsumed had to be burned. Now why should the animal be roasted? The reason is this. When you talk about the word roast, it's automatically associated with the idea of fire. And in the Bible, fire usually represents judgment. And so in this case, what it meant was that judgment was to fall, okay, it was supposed to fall on the firstborn. But instead of being on the firstborn sons, it has now been transferred to the lamb or the kid. And then the eating of the bitter herbs was a reminder to them that they had gone through hardships while they lived in Egypt. And then unleavened bread, unleavened bread was eaten. You see, yeast or even signified corruption or sin. And so this meal was a reminder to the Israelites that they identified with the land that was slain, that they remembered the conditions they were in prior to their deliverance, and that they are turned away from the old life in order to follow God. And so these are the four things that we need to understand about the lamb or the kid that was offered. Now what was the implications? What were the implications of the Passover lamb for the Israelites? First of all, it was a reminder to them that deliverance or salvation was the work of God. God had made it clear that it was He who would deliver the people of Israel. He also made clear that this deliverance will come by His appointed means or according means. And that is through the Lamb or through the kid that will be sacrificed and whose blood will be placed on the door, doorpost and on the top of the door. And so the people of Israel had to follow the Lord's plan if they wanted to be saved. They cannot make up their own plan as to how they want to be delivered. It had to be God's plan. So it was a reminder to them that the deliverance or salvation that they so desire is the work of God. It is not their work. Second, it was a reminder to them that salvation is costly. You know, God could have easily protected the Israelites, just like what he did in the first nine plagues, right? He just simply did not allow hail to fall on the Israelites. He did not allow darkness to be upon the land of Goshen. He could have done that easily. But here, God was reminding them, your salvation is a costly one. 
you ordain that a lamb, an animal, be killed and the blood be used in order to save the Israelites. Because to let the Israelites understand that the lamb was taking the place of the firstborn son. The firstborn son should have died, but the lamb took his place. And then the roasting of the lamb, as I mentioned earlier, is symbolic of judgment. And so the lamb, as the substitute of the Israelites, took upon itself the judgment that should have fallen on the first court. And then thirdly, it was a reminder that faith is essential to salvation. If the people of Israel wanted their first court to be spared from the plague, they had to follow the instructions given by God. Obedience is a sign that they believe in God and His Word. And they acted upon what they heard from God through Moses. And it was this act of faith in them. Okay, I believe God, this is what you're going to do here. So I'm going to obey. This brought about salvation and deliverance for them. It was not about anything good that they had done. It's not about any good works. No. But instead, salvation was all about God's word. What they had to do was they had to act on their faith in God by doing what God wanted for them. And so faith is essential to salvation. And so they were reminded of this truth whenever Passover was, uh, was celebrated. Now, how does this apply for us today? None of us here are Jews or Israelites. So how exactly does this apply to us? But let me say this, for us as Christians, the Passover event it applies to us very much. You know why? Because the Passover story points us to the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. In fact, if you read 1 Corinthians 5-7, you'll be fascinated by what Paul wrote. He said, get rid of the old yeast so that you may be a new unleavened batch as you really are. And then he said, For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Take note of that. Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Jesus Christ is our Passover lamb. And not only that, read the testimony of John the Baptist when he pointed to Jesus, what did he say? Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And then of course later on uh, during the Last Supper Jesus said that the bread symbolized his body and the wine or the cup symbolized the blood that he would shed. This is the language of the Passover celebration. And so the New Testament authors, and even Jesus himself, they recognize that he is the Passover man. Jesus also knew this mission, that he would die on behalf of each one of us, so that God's wrath against us we who are willful and wretched sinners may be appeased. The Passover story, in light of the full revelation of the gospel of who Jesus is, it reminds us that all of us, we are under bondage, or we were under bondage. We were under the bondage of sin. And because we are under this bondage, we need deliverance and salvation. We cannot save ourselves using our own effort or our own invented devices or schemes. And that is why God had to provide us with the answer to the sin problem. In the same way, 
how were the firstborn spared in Egypt? It was God who provided them with the solution, telling them you have to slay a lamb, an unblemished lamb. And so it was the same thing here. God sees our situation. We need saving. And how does He do it? He gives us a solution. His Son, Jesus. God's one and only Son. He is the costly sacrifice that God was willing to pay in order for us to be saved and for us to be made right with Him. He is the Passover Lamb because He is unblemished. We all know Jesus was perfectly sinless. He was born of a virgin and He lived His life in such a way that no one could accuse Him of sinning. And when He was at the prime of His life, at 33 years old, He went to the cross. And when He went to the cross, He became the perfect sacrifice or the perfect substitute. He took upon Himself your sins and my sins and He died there on that cross. He took upon Himself the punishment that we deserve. And so we all have to respond to the work of Christ with faith. And this faith means that we believe that what He did for us is the only way for us to be made right with God. And that it alone is sufficient to take away our sins and to make us right with God. That is what faith in Jesus is all about. That's why the Bible tells us in Romans 10, 9, if we declare with our mouths that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised Him from the dead, we will be saved. The Bible tells us that faith is to be confessed, or faith must be affirmed before others and must be believed in our hearts. Also, the elements of the bitter herbs and unleavened bread, they remind us also of our previous state as well as our present standing. The bitter herbs back then reminded the Israelites of their bondage in Egypt. We, as we stand before Jesus, we must be reminded constantly that before we were under the bondage of sin and that we deserve nothing less than His wrath, His condemnation. But in Christ, not only have we been saved from our sins, but our status has been changed. The unleavened bread, it signifies holiness. And so for us today, Jesus died for us, not just for us to be saved from our sins, but He died for us so that we can become His holy people. God is continuing to save us. He didn't just save us once in the past, but He continues to save us from the reign of sin in our lives. The Passover, it was special for the Jewish people because they were saved from God's wrath. But we have something even more special. Jesus, the Lamb of God, saves us from the wrath of God. The wrath of God that was brought about by our sins that resulted because of our sins. But Jesus paid that penalty on our behalf. And this applies to all peoples. This offer is for everyone. And so this morning, I just want to conclude by saying that I hope that we will appreciate the salvation that we have in Jesus Christ. You know, very often we think this gift of salvation for granted. But I hope that we will remember who we were before. We were sinners. We deserve nothing less than the condemnation of God. We deserve nothing less than His anger. And then we recall also 
that right now I stand before God, holy, forgiven, loved. And my prayer also for those here this morning who maybe you've been coming to church for a while or maybe uh, this is just your first time here. If you don't know Jesus yet, I pray that you will come to truly know Him. That He's the one who has paid a huge price for your salvation. And that you will say yes to Him and say, I believe. I will turn away from my sins and I will be as my beloved Savior. At this moment, I want to end by playing a song entitled Only a Lamb. And I want us to just take time to meditate on the meaning of the song and to personally respond in faith to the Lord Jesus and to renew again our commitment to Him that we will love Him and we will follow him, that we will be his own people in light of what he has done for us.
Son's precious name.